Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm Connor Old, and welcome to the Seventh Connors, the annual award show that I do every year, where I get to talk about some of my favorite movies of the year. No more of the Oscar prognosticating, just for now. We've got the nominations out. We're going to predict what's going to happen at the Oscars, what I think is going to win. But as we do every year, you guys can get a little bit of a glimpse into my thoughts, into my favorite movies of the year. So this is the Connors, this is my award show. I come up with all the nominations and I give some of my favorite performances of the year, my favorite scenes, my favorite trailers, cinematography, editing, picture, of course, director, all the big categories, but then some fun ones as well, like best moment in a film or best small part categories that I make up. Some years are different than others. Sometimes I'll talk about best animated film. I won't do that this year, but then this year I also have a unique category called best monologue, but there won't be a monologue at the top because I'm not a comedian. This is just a bit of an award show that I like to do every year, a personal award show where you guys can hear my thoughts on some of the best movies of the year, and then hopefully maybe check out a couple of them if you haven't seen them. So starting off with best supporting actor, my nominees are Glenn Powell for Top Gun Maverick. Stephen Yun, Nope. Paul Dano, The Fablemans. Martin Henderson, X. And Brad Pitt, Babylon. And the winner is... Paul Dano, The Fablemans. Uh, so starting off with a, a few interesting categories here, supporting actors. So how I, I like to do it essentially is just talk about each of the nominees, why I like them, and then ultimately that final one, the winner, and why I sort of thought that was maybe my favorite of the bunch. But here, Glenn Powell, Top Gun Maverick, kind of like an Iceman character, but now in the sequel. I've been rooting for Glenn Powell for a long time, ever since I saw him and set it up. And he's just been a guy that has so much charisma and is a total movie star, and we're just waiting for him to get that opportunity. And I think he really got it now, and it sort of launched him into a, a total sort of A-list type status. We'll see if he's able to lead a movie on his own, but he is in that sort of uh, era of exciting young actors that I'm looking for, because he's got that movie star charisma and charm, and to a full extent here in Top Gun Maverick. Uh, Stephen Yun in Nope. Nope wasn't a movie that I totally loved, but I thought Stephen Yun was absolutely terrific in it, particularly that sort of monologue of him talking about the Chris Kattan scene in an SNL and him sort of, him sort of just reliving his, his past and his trauma and trying to control it. I thought he was probably the most fascinating character of the bunch and Stephen Young, like Glenn Powell, is one of those actors that I can't wait to see what he does next because he's really on, on a roll right now, whether it be Okja or Burning um, or now Nope, he really is an exciting young actor as well. Martin Henderson for X. This one was something that uh, I think a lot of people sort of underrated. I thought he was the sort of classic um, sleazeball kind of a porn director guy in the sense that he's able to charm people but then also be able to turn it on a dime and, and be able to intimidate sort of the more uh, uh, weaker parts of the group and he totally had that sort of cowboy charm but also this element of sleaze i think he totally nailed he's an underrated actor and i wanted to recognize him here for a great performance in x and then brad pitt from babylon he's almost a co-lead but i decided to put him in supporting actor because he isn't that sort of main romance of, of diego and margot's the characters but yet he's still sort of sort of empathetic because he's maybe not the most committed actor but he's still sort of definitely committed to films and when he has that speech of, of you know having something that will last versus the sort of broadway speech he's you know incredibly passionate but he can also be very funny like in that sort of opening uh, uh a first day of filming scene where he has that sort of magic light moment so terrific in that and then of course at the ending and the sort of how his character arc evolves i thought he was able to do both the sort of first act and the second act in both the complexities and i thought he was uh, well deserving uh, for babylon and then my winner paul dano for the fatal wins and this one almost really wasn't a competition as soon as i saw paul dano i thought that may be his best performance and that's saying something for an actor that's had so much so much success for there will be blood and prisoners and even um the batman earlier in this year but for the Fablemans, he was probably the character I, I connected most to just because there's an element of stoicism that is rarely seen in films that I thought he was really just totally terrific at. Bert was able to be a little bit more restrained, a little bit more stoic, but still have that yearning. He still has those scenes where he's able to demonstrate the, the love for his wife, even though she doesn't necessarily always reciprocate that and maybe the ways he wanted to and how he sort of always stood by the side and stood for the family and then ultimately took the blame for the divorce 
It is almost what Dano doesn't show at times that really allows us the emotions to build up and well up in that sort of internal conflict that he has where he's clearly this genius but his son isn't necessarily the way he wanted him to turn out and he's supportive but he doesn't totally understand it. There's a great complexity that's going on. I think Dano is the central performance of The Fablemans and is the reason why that movie works so well. Then Best Supporting Actress, I have Elizabeth Olsen for Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, Kate Hudson for Glass Onion, Isabella Rossellini for Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, Zoe Kravitz for The Batman, and Marsha Gay Harden for Confess Fletch. And the winner is... Isabella Rossellini, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. Uh, so here, uh, Elizabeth Olsen, I thought she was a really key part of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, which I think is an underrated MCU film. I'm surprised that not people, not as much people loved it as I, I thought I did. Not only is she the sort of core emotional part of the, the beginning of, of the film, but her sort of turn into a villain over the course of this sort of entire MCU arc, I thought was a really smart choice and, and, and an understandable choice because of what she experienced with Vision and sort of being understandably mad at... Um, Stephen Strange, and then sort of her eventual sort of almost incredibly witch-esque, horror movie-esque, with the help of, of course, a director like Sam Raimi, in that second half, she was able to go full evil, she was able to go full crazy, she was incredibly powerful as, as a hero, but also incredibly deserving, and a great acting job by Elizabeth Olsen in those scenes with her kids, so you have an emotional backstory to a character, but then you also have that ability to have the evilness and the deviousness and the real sort of a scary element of her character was so well exemplified here by, by Elizabeth Olsen. I actually think she should be the uh, first MCU performance nominated. Then I have Kate Hudson from Glass Onion, who's my favorite part of that cast, although Edward Norton gives a, a, a close second, but she was so funny, whether it be just her, her mannerisms or <laughs> her misunderstanding of what a sweatshop is. Kate Hudson is great at playing kind of the dumb blonde, but I think in this one, she, her comedic timing is underrated and her ability to execute on those scenes where she really is, you know, makes a lot of sense in, within her own head, even though she may be uh, not the brightest everyone else in the room. Very funny performance from Kate Hudson. Zoe Kravitz, the Batman. I thought she was a terrific Catwoman at both sexy, but also intelligent. And similarly to uh, Elizabeth Olsen, Multiverse of Madness, I thought was sort of understandable. It's sort of hard to toe the balance of being an anti-hero so she has her own backstory and her reasons for doing so and then maybe she's executing on that justice in the way that maybe we don't necessarily want her to do but despite that i think she carries incredible confidence and an enacting sense of justice throughout her performance so i thought she was quite good there then i have marcia gay harden for confess fletch and she's here really just for her choice and her uh, decision to ultimately say that line of flesh <laughs> for Confess Fletch. Just every line she talks about flesh in her kind of Italian accent uh, is so funny. It's the line of the year, probably. And uh, she's great in the movie as well, but that could be a choice. Uh, I'll be hearing uh, that the way she says uh, flesh um, every time I see the movie and every time I think of her. So uh, just an iconic kind of a performance there from her. But the, ultimately, the winner went to Isabella Rossellini for Marcel the Shell with Shoes On who's been a great actress, but I feel like she's really starting to have kind of a great late period um, resurgence in many ways. And Marcella Shell, she's on, she's actually not in the film. It's a partly animated film and she plays the grandmother to Marcel, but also being a shell and she has her own little garden. And there's an element of the voice performance that I don't think is always recognized, which is the ability to modulate the voice where it's a shell, it's a stop motion character. There's very little expression going on, but the way Isabel Rossellini sort of changes the pitch of, of her voice in, in moments of sort of excitement but then of course when she's sort of she's older so she's starting to die she uh has a little bit more tiredness in her voice and um to convey that all through a voice performance in a sense of just grandmotherly love and warmth but also sort of wisdom she's able to convey all of that it makes her feel like an older shell even though you know the shells themselves are very similar in, in size and shape it's her performance that brings so much life within the film, and I really do think she's the film wouldn't work as well without her. She really is critical, and she's doing all that just with her voice performance, an underrated element as well. So I thought Isabel Rossellini for Barcelona the Shell with Shoes On hasn't been talked about much, but she was absolutely terrific in it. Now I have one of my favorite categories here, best moment in a film, which is essentially just the best scene, or it could even be smaller than that. It doesn't have to be a full scene, but just sort of one little snapshot within a film that I thought was my favorite that I, I will probably be watching on YouTube for years to come. So 
the nominees are Sailing by Christopher Cross, the scene in Ambulance, uh, the Ice Band Maverick reunion in Top Gun Maverick, the tea scene in After Yang, the quiet on set slash hello college scene from Babylon, and then the hallway scene from The Fablemans. And the winner is the hallway scene, The Fablemans. Uh, so this sort of sailing scene here for the Chris, uh, in, in Ambulance, this is sort of the moment that uh, was probably the funniest moment in the film and a total revelation in the sense that this is an intense, incredibly high-paced, action-packed movie, but then we had this sort of moment of, of levity, of brotherly love, when the two brothers sing this sort of song that they um, sang when they were kids in Sailing by Christopher Cross. Uh, just that sort of perfect um, cutting back and forth between them singing and actually us hearing the song to them just singing a cappella, and we can hear what um, Lisa Gonzalez's character in, in the ambulance is, is hearing. A great bit of levity in a super action-packed movie. Uh, the Iceman Maverick reunion is a brilliant piece of directing by Joseph Kaczynski. Because you have Val Kilmer who can't really speak, you have this moments where he's using the computer screen and the typing. He does so to build tension, uh, elements of a great monologue there by Tom Cruise, but then also cutting back to the screen and um, Iceman and having his sort of emotion of Al Kilmer as an actor, but also using the text of him typing with a computer screen really beautifully in a way that you haven't really seen done. It was kind of an awkward challenge to do, and I thought Kaczynski did a great job at executing that. And then, of course, the acting from Val Kilmer, but particularly from Tom Cruise, really showing emotion for the first time that we haven't seen in a long time. So many times I think Cruise makes the mistake of being too much of an action hero, too flawless. But now as he gets older and he has these sort of regrets and these vulnerabilities, it does feel like a proper sequel because this is his time for Pete Mitchell to actually sort of talk about his feelings and not just be the ultra badass hero, but to also sort of talk about his regrets and unsureness of what to do. That's what makes him really a terrific hero in this film. And, you know, Cruz gives us these performances every f five or six years, um, but he definitely let it uh, all out there. And um, even just the sort of subtle use of the voice at the very end from Val Kilmer um, was a beautiful sort of a moment of saving it, saving it. And then when he actually does say something, it hits powerfully. But then still a little moment of levity at the end, a little bit of competition between the two, too. Uh, so that was fun. The tea scene in After Yang, uh, just a scene of, of, of a memory of Colin Farrell's character talking about um, why he loves tea and his sort of revelation of the fact that he watched this documentary uh, about how in this case, the, the documentary is actually all on this tea, uh, Werner Herzog. So it's Colin Farrell doing a Werner Herzog expression of this character, recollect, uh, recollecting a moment of why he loves tea based on a description of Werner Herzog. And just this sort of beautiful uh, little moment of understanding of why someone has dedicated their life to tea, not necessarily for the taste, but for the experience before it represents, but because of all the history that's within it. And it's a real sort of declaration of passion and I was engaged the entire time. And just the way sort of, it's a, it's a memory. Colin Farrell's r r sort of referring through it, through the um, glasses, through Yang's memory, but then I think the way Coconut actually um, sort of intercuts things and, and overlaps things and has dialogue repeat multiple times. The way I sort of interpret that was it was Yang's memory playing as viewed by Colin Farrell, but then also it's um, Colin Farrell's own memory replaying the scene in his head and sort of overlapping it together. Interesting kind of a way of, of cutting together the scene and just a beautiful uh, monologue and explanation sort of back and forth dialogue scene from Alfred Yang. Then I have the quiet on set slash hello college scene from Babylon. Um, this is a scene where they're finally transitioned into sound and there is this sort of difficulties as we see where at the f first part there's this beautiful silent sort of production going on with five or six productions going on at once. They get the light, there's this huge sort of grandiose moment uh, and scene and then the, the scene after that when we introduce sound we actually, or well, not the scene right after that, but eventually when we uh, introduce sound we we see the stark contrast where before they were free and no safety rules and whatnot. And now there's a guy in a box because the camera's too loud and he's sweating and the sound guy's getting crazy and you can't hit your mark. And they think this should be an easy scene and it's not. And it gets crazier and funnier and more ridiculous. And, and just a, a hard to pick not say that the um, uh, Gold Coast sunset scene, the f filming scene there, but just the contrast with, with this scene, uh, I thought was actually probably the, the funnier of, of the two and uh, was probably my favorite there. But the winner is the hallway scene in The Fablemans. I think it is the film, it is the scene that unlocks that second half. You know, I really enjoy that sort of first two thirds of the film where we had the relationship being the central part of the movie, being um, uh, 
the Steven Spielberg's his parents and their relationship, and then the Seth Rogen character Benny and their kind of a weird kind of three three thruple situation. But when we get to the second half and we start to see, or it's really the last third, we start to see the high school stuff and the bullying. And I was like, man, this is really American graffiti. This is really cheesy. This is kind of strangely poor writing. But then, you know, I was kind of going, why are we here in this section of, of the movie? Why have we not sort of concluded? Why have we not done a flash forward? What's the point of it? And then I think the point of the scene ultimately, and then the sort of second half, being in high school ultimately is for some moments of levity and at the Jesus scene and whatnot, but ultimately for this hallway scene, sort of a declaration in a thesis of many way of Steven Spielberg and his films and a lack of understanding as to why you make someone look the way they do or why you do some things. You know, you have the, the two actors in Gabriel LaBelle and the, the jock who he doesn't, neither of them really understand why it's impacted them or why they feel so angry, but then this idea of creating something that can't be lived up to was sort of damning to him, and then Sammy Fableman doesn't know exactly why he shot him that way anyways, if it was good for the story or if he wanted to like him. It was sort of a complex series of emotions that sort of explained the sort of effervescent, the almost un, un understandable sort of power of movies where you don't necessarily are able to incredibly articulate why you like something or why it impacts you. You just know that it does. And I thought that was sort of a key scene within the film, a strange scene. You didn't know where it was going to go. You didn't know if it was maybe homoerotic or he wasn't sure if it was going to, was going to beat him up. It's this strange complex of emotions, incredibly sort of complex in its writing as well. Uh, but definitely the scene of the year for me, just in, in how I wasn't sure how to feel about it. I didn't sure where it was going to go. And it's very rare in a year when I've seen, you know, 77 uh, 2022 releases. It, it, it was rare to see a movie where you really didn't know where a scene was going to evolve or what was going to happen next and had you on the edge of your seat. So fascinating stuff there. Then in this next category, a new category, as I mentioned, best monologue. The nominees are the house monologue from Ticket to Paradise, done by George Clooney. The ending of Pearl from Mia Goth. The classroom scene from Tar, uh, done by Kate Blanchett. Uh, others will have this exact same conversation from Babylon, done by Gene Smart. And then the opening monologue of the Batman, of course, done by Robert Pattinson. And the winner is the house monologue, Ticket to Paradise, George Clooney. So the ending of Pearl uh, was, you know, I liked Pearl as a sort of 40s freak out film. Uh, however, that really ending where you it, not, never since say something like call me by your name have we held on someone's reaction and just being so devastating in a, in a different way in a sort of a scary empathetic sad sympathetic almost in a certain way we really feel for this person you don't understand them always but you feel for them and their plight and their sort of desire to be something of course there's a great sort of prequel to X um, and I thought Mia Goth really sort of demonstrated like wow she's an incredible actor she's someone we have to watch out for and I can't wait for something like Infinity Pool with Brandon Cronenberg to see what she does there uh, the classroom scene in Tar I could have gone with the opening monologue in Tar in which Kate Blanchett really excels but the incredible writing of the classroom scene and just how the way Kate Blanchett's you know subtly but also powerfully and intellectually sort of disarms and destroys and embarrasses this young student <clears throat> in a way that is smart and intelligent that she's not necessarily wrong in her statement but in a way that she sort of undermines the student from the entire class and how it's a one take and she sort of slowly walks around and almost prowls around the classroom an incredible tension where Kate Blanchett is a classic scene where she's in full form of her craft. She's able to capture your attention just with her performance, just the way she executes her lines or moves from one line to the next. Brilliant stuff from Kate Blanchett. Uh, then others will have this exact same uh, uh, conversation was the conversation between Gene Smart and Brad Pitt in Babylon in which he sort of confronts her saying, you know, why is this the end of my career, essentially? Why are you writing this stuff? And she just goes, you know, this is a medium that will have last long after us, sort of looking forward. It's sort of, of course, now the movie's made today, so there's this meta element to it as well. And just sort of an incredible performance from Gene Smart in her ability to undress, but also comfort, I think, Brad Pitt and his character, the fact that he did great stuff, he's at the end of his road now, but that's okay, and others will have this conversation long after us, and that you're the stuff right now, but you won't be, and you will be forgotten a hundred years from now, and that's okay. I thought that was a really beautiful way to put it, and a great scene. And then the opening monologue from the Batman, Robert Pattinson, just talking about, really introducing us in this opening monologue, 
not the opening scene of the film, but the first time, time we hear Robert Pattinson in his voice, immediately sort of assuring me, at least, that you know he could do the voice, that he is this great Batman. We'll be talking about him later. Um, but just the fact that this idea of fear of him being in the shadows of the symbol of Batman, I thought was a really sort of way to engage us into this sort of rain-heavy um, emo, almost kind of a Batman that the film was portraying. And I thought that opening monologue and his delivery of it, even though we don't see his face, was a great mood setting piece for the film. But the winner is House Monologue from Ticket of Paradise. And this is a movie, George Clooney, Julia Robertson, which is a rom-com. It's very light on its feet. It's not always super serious. Um, and, you know, we, it has a sort of funny banter, which is sort of easy to sort of think of as, oh, that's easy to do, that, that's light. But then we get a monologue like this, and George Clooney reminds us of how great of an actor he is and how much he can inject into life the emotion of the film. And why I actually think the film works really well is, is only not only because of the sort of dynamic screwball comedy banter between Julia Roberts and George Clooney, but then also a scene like this, in which he's at the, if you have seen the film, he's at a hotel bar talking to his daughter's friend in Bali and just talking about his life and what went wrong with the relationship and how this this house fire really sort of marked the end uh, of their relationship and that was more than a house and here's this sort of slow push in classic stuff of George Clooney with a cocktail in, in a suit at a hotel bar at night and there's this sense of vulnerability and tiredness that allows him to open up and Clooney uh, reads that all just a little reminder to you that Clooney is still one of the best actors of the generation even if he's doing the light stuff in Ticket to Paradise he can still pull this out of his a trick out of his hat and uh, do incredible work so an engaging monologue in a movie that you wouldn't expect it. If you haven't seen the film, I definitely recommend it. But even if, even if you're not interested in the film, I think the monologue alone is worth watching. Then in the best design category, I have Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, X, Top Gun Maverick, After Yang, and Living. And the winner goes to X. Uh, so Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, I thought was just so creative and inventive in its ability to have this shell type world in which you have a shell that can roll through a tennis ball and cuts that open or uses the um, stand mixer to shake the tree. This is sort of creative little things of how a shell would be able to function on a day to day life. Um, using household objects, just a creative kind of a way in, in the design. So the design category I haven't mentioned here is like production design, but costume design, but sound design, kind of the overall look and feel. That's not the cinematography of the film. Just want to combine a lot of categories together. So Marshall the Shell with Shoes On, the creative inventiveness of that design was great. Top Gun Maverick is an underrated design movie in the sense that it feels classical, that there's a bar, of course, there's no cell phones, so that sort of understands why we don't see that throughout the film. So there's an old school kind of timeless element to it. Of course, you have the classic cars, you have the boat, even some of the sort of the classic New England-esque old money sweaters that Jennifer Conley wears are so beautiful, sort of timeless, classic. That was the feel of the film and it, it was achieved absolutely. Then uh, After Yang is another sort of soft sci-fi futuristic film. It reminds you me very much of like kind of a you know, Ozu film or um, just in its design, kind of Eastern and Japanese, because it's the, whether it be the tea shop or some of the more futuristic places that Colin Farrell finds himself, or even just like that car that he travels in that he's not driving, that's kind of like a individual subway thing, uh, I thought was just sort of genius, smart, and, 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 and easy, simple ways to make a, a, maybe more of a low-budget film feel like it's still a sci-fi movie in the future. And then Living. Uh, of course, that's the classic design of the original film and in Kiru, the Kurosawa film. But then this one I thought they did similarly well, whether it be just the sort of old school pubs or the costumes of these sort of uniforms that the old men uh, wear of the kind of suit and the hat. But then, of course, that actual bureaucracy building of the papers uh, stacking up, of course, once again, taking inspiration from the original, but then I think executing it very well of quite literally the, the papers being so high that they're over engulfing them and they're sort of hard, they're sort of tucked away in this little corner of this building, this, this parks committee. And then finally that final park that is built and the simplicity of it, but the beauty of it in itself with the swing and whatnot, I thought was just sort of simply done, but beautifully done as well. But the winner went to X because I felt every element of that film felt like a sort of 70s homage to a sort of sleazy slasher type horror movie. In just the sort of costumes of the characters, how you're able to understand, oh yeah, this is the nerd, this is the sort of exploring a girlfriend, uh, you know, this is the sleazy cowboy type, uh, this is a sort of professional blonde. 
Um, and then even when we get into that, so then there's like sort of that old shack that they're in, which is sort of wonderfully realized. And then of course that sort of main house and the sort of little knickknacks you'll see on the walls and, and throughout the house makes it feel like it's been there for years and hasn't been updated. So you have this sort of old clashing with the new, uh, really well realized, really well sort of attention to detail and just the overall film's vibe, the tone, the atmosphere of the, the locations, of the costumes, of the little details. I thought the design in X was terrific. Then the best small part, so essentially not a supporting actor, still sort of small enough that they have a little bit of a bit part, almost a cameo, but probably a little bit more than a cameo. I have Wale from Ambulance. I have Ugly Sonic, voiced by Tim Robinson in Chippendale Rescue Rangers. I have Stephen Atlee Gurgis in Funny Pages. I have Spike Jones in Babylon. And I have Chloe Sevigny in Bones and All. And the winner is... Ugly Sonic from Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Um, so Wally and Ambulance is just a fun element where you have this, you know, another sort of comedic element in the film where it's such a high-paced action film, um, but then Wale seems even more stressed out than the guys who should be stressed out and that kind of a lack of awareness and lack of a guy to have any sort of pressure whatsoever and some of the this dumb stuff that he makes, still very funny. Um, Stephen Atlee Gurgis in Funny Pages. I didn't really like Funny Pages in part because I really like Stephen Atlee Curtis, and then when he died pretty early on in the film, 15 minutes in the film, it's kind of a depressing film after that, but just his ability to be a kind of heartwarming but strange, and you don't know if it's going to be like a sexual thing or just a true mentor thing, and his sort of confidence and his comfortability really linger throughout the film, I think purposefully in a sort of sad, confusing kind of way, but it's due to Atlee Curtis's, um Stephen's performances, performance at that beginner to be beginning to be so full of life, to be so powerful um, as sort of this mentor teacher. Then Spike Jones in Babylon playing essentially Eric von Stroheim. A uh, little funny kind of a nod, I thought. The fact that you know Spike Jones, we don't see act too often. He directs very, even more rarely, but he is a great actor and does sort of these bit parts and whatnot. And he's almost unrecognizable in the film, but doing his best kind of director performance, being a director himself, kind of a nice uh, meta element there. Glad to see him there. Very funny as well, being that demand director uh, and then Chloe Sevigny in Bones and All I didn't recognize her at first because she's so withered away in the film and tucked into this corner without um, her hands um, and just sort of eeriness and creepiness that one was almost scene of the year just the way you're really unsure of how that scene plays out and I just totally didn't even recognize her and that's a true definition I think in my opinion of a transformative performance where I was like who is that and I didn't realize until after the film that it actually was Chloe Sevigny it really blew me away and she has this one scene performance but she, and, and, and wordless um, but she's so powerful with her, her language and her body movement and that sort of eventual strike. But the winner went to Ugly Sonic from Tim Robinson from Chippendale Rescue Rangers, which is the film that I think was maybe underrated and underappreciated, but it's a really funny film from earlier in the year. One of the best comedies of the year. And that sort of introduction of Ugly Sonic was just a, a, a huge laugh out loud moment for me just because I didn't realize that you would do that, you know, uh, it's a, and, and to label it Ugly Sonic, you know, I just thought of it as Sonic with the, the human mouth or the old version of Sonic. But the fact that you could bring him back, the fact that they got permission to do that, and then Tim Robinson just in his ability to sort of breathe life into, oh yeah, I realize that I'm being laughed at, but I'm enjoying it, but then secretly maybe being more hurt by it. Uh, and then his eventual sort of third act return was a great moment too. So he's a small part, but in his sort of parts, Tim Robinson breathes a lot of sort of fun. And just the idea of Ugly Sonic as a character, I thought was just uh, so brilliant and so funny. Then best editing, I have Tar, Ambulance, Top Gun Maverick, Decision to Leave, and Moon Age Daydream. And the winner is... Moon Age Daydream. Uh, so quickly going here through some of these more smaller ones. Tar I thought was brilliant, particularly even the ending of how we should flash forward a little bit and go through a, a large sequence of time quickly through events, but you're not exactly sure always where we are in the story or how long it's been. Smart storytelling way and editing way to sort of keep us guessing and keep us engaged. Um, Ambulance, of course, is an incredible job at keeping this incredibly rapidly edited film, but always keeping your attention, always making sure you know where the characters are. Uh, rapid camera, hard to do with shaky camera work and moving all the time, but to keep the editing, to keep the pace and to keep the tension through a two hour and 15 minute long film, it's really hard to do. It's easier to do in a 90 minute film, which is fast, 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 but to do it for a two hour, 15 minute movie and to constantly sort of up the ante, uh, the editing uh, was terrific in Ambulance. Top Gun Maverickly, similarly, if you just think of that sort of opening scene of 
reaching Mach 10 and just the simpleness of the shaking of the, of the cockpit, cutting to the, the numbers, cutting to the control room, rather seeing the numbers and then the reaction faces. It's just this beautiful sort of combination of back and forth of building that tension. Because since he continually does that throughout the editing of the film, so respect there. Decision to Leave, one of the best probably directed movies of the year. Even though it didn't totally resonate with me, maybe I need to see it again, but the editing absolutely stuck out to me. Whether it be just that opening scene of the, the shot of the cliff and then coming down to the shot of the eyeball of the dead body at the ground, the sort of the macro, the small, or even those sort of premium sushi takeout boxes, how the editing, emphasizes well actually having quality dialogue that they are this sort of fancier kind because of how they're constructed and how they're sort of cleanly moved to the side very satisfying editing but the winner went to moon age daydream because of its ability to take all this archival footage and then record you know live reactions of sound and shoot with those IMAX cameras, seeing it in a theater on this massive screen was this overwhelming experience. And in a movie like Top Gun Maverick, there is a sort of classical way of to start a scene and to end a scene. But when you have a portrait of an artist and you're trying to, through, trying to understand them through the editing, through these clips, through their music being played, it's hard to sort of get all of those clips together, choose the right clips, and actually make some edits, edits and make some choices. And then how those scenes sort of weave through together to create this sort of liquid narrative, to create ultimately an essence of Bowie as an artist. The Moody's Daydream editing was just a genius stuff. Then best score, this is a really tough one. A lot of great scores from this year, but my nominees are The Batman, Michael Giacchino, Ambulance, Lauren Balfe, Blonde, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis, Babylon, Justin Hurwitz, and Glass Onion, Nathan Johnston. And the winner is The Batman, Michael Giacchino. So Ambulance here, Lauren Balfe. Strange score from a action kind of a movie. You would think it would be similar to his score, say for Mission Impossible Fallout. Kind of this drum-based heavy action kind of a tension builds, built score. But the way they do it is not only drums, but almost this electronic EDM based um, fusion, I guess you would call it. Really strange score, but totally adds to the tension of the film and the eeriness uh, of moments, but actually a, a, an inspired choice to use that kind of EDM strangeness, but works really well here um, within the film. Blonde, Nick Cave, and Warren Ellis. Just, a, a, you know, he, their score for um, Assassination of Jesse James is my favorite of all time. And then in this film to create that sort of sonic dissonance of the strings, of the sort of spiraling of Marilyn's consciousness and her life and the sort of trauma that she experienced um, perfectly uh, matched here. But some really beautiful pieces here as well to listen on its own while also being matched with the film. Babylon, Justin Hurwitz, almost the winner here. Um, I love Justin Hurwitz, you know, pastime Connor award winner. And he gives, you know, great themes throughout the film, whether it be the sort of um, Margot Diego theme um, or whether it be these sort of Gold Coast sunsets where we have this sort of buildup and then the boom of the big horns and the big sort of orchestra coming together and it's grandiose and it's glorious. Or even the wild child theme, um, which is fast and exciting and talks about that kind of a, a future. There's all these different themes throughout the film that are indicative of different characters or different moments in time. And then when we hear them later on, of course, it reminds you of the past and the history and where we've come. So a brilliant use of light motifs throughout the film. And then Glass Johnson, Nathan Johnson, Glass Onion for Nathan Johnson, similarly with light motifs of being sort of Andy's theme, what we hear, which is sort of beautiful, but then also sort of the, the what I would call sort of puzzle box-esque narrative is perfectly exemplified by Nathan Johnson's score of kind of the more exotic instruments that are being used for that main theme, but then still having this sort of large piece orchestra of, of strings to sort of come in and fill in through those outsides to create like a bombastic feeling. So when we enter that glass onion island, it has a sort of feeling of adventure and excitement, but of bigness and boldness. Johnson did a great job there. But the winner was Michael Giacchino for the Batman because I thought he created some iconic scores for the Batman, which is incredibly hard to do. But this is a score that you will be hearing, I think, 50 years time associating with the Batman even in the same way Hans Zimmer did with the Dark Knight and that kind of a theme but I think even this so is different because it's not as big and serious and bombastic as Hans Zimmer's it's much lighter it's based on pianos or the violin of that sort of moonlight serenade kind of a, of a piece of this sort of boy side we'll call it of Batman but then you have the fear side of Batman the serious side of Batman which has more of the big booming elements so you have kind of the, the dual element and then you have something like Catwoman's theme which is a little bit more stranger it was a little bit more mystical 
so many different elements that Giacchino has layered into the, the, the film. And this is a guy who's done Up, who's done Incredibles, and yet I think this may be his best score. Best documentary, I have Moon Age Daydream, Navalny, Into the Deep, Stutz, and the Redeem Team, with the winner being Moon Age Daydream. Um, Navalny is a pretty interesting documentary, but really has really one super interesting scene of a conversation where they essentially reveal the secrets that Navalny was poisoned by at least someone, you know, connection with the Putin regime. Fascinating stuff, if true, and a great sort of tense conversation. Um, Into the Deep is another fascinating Netflix documentary, kind of a true crime documentary. I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil it, but one of those documentaries where you go, wow, oh, I can't believe this is true. What a crazy story. What a crazy instance of a documentary film actually capturing this, seeing the end of what actually happened, and then seeing the truth and how you're able to recontextualize those scenes. Beautiful, really well done. Stutz is a really, I think, contemplative um introspective documentary by Jonah Hill talking to his therapist and how he's able to work through that and then how do you make a movie about your own life in Jonah Hill and your relationship with your mother without being in front of it and then sort of the vulnerabilities and the artificiality that's stripped away from the film to try to create a sense of authenticity. <clears throat> really fascinating stuff. The Redeem Team, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty basic basketball documentary, but with some incredible stories about Kobe Bryant, who's one of my favorite players, and just hearing those guys recollect about that uh, time and what they had to do to sort of change their mentality really stuck with me. But the winner was Moon Age Daydream, and, and by a, a mile, it didn't make my best picture lineup, but it almost did, and this was sort of the consolation prize because I get to talk about it here. And as I mentioned with the editing, to create that essence of Bowie was so well done. But I just thought the theater experience, and I don't even know if I'm going to watch it again, but that theater experience of the IMAX, of the sound, of essentially using Bowie and his own words and no talking heads, but just his own words, his own music, his own footage to create an essence of <clears throat> the man's artistic output. And it's an interesting way how we're not trying to understand the man as a person, but the man as an artist, the man as we see him. And I thought that's what the film was almost trying to get at you, was how is he as his art? How is he as the stardust? And then how he sort of evolved throughout those and then became kind of his own personal and, and using his words and using his art and using his music to try to understand what his pure essence was as an artist. Bowie's one of my favorite artists of all time. And I thought this documentary, like Brett Morgan said, if you want a Talking Heads you know, Wikipedia page, there's plenty of documentaries made, but if you want sort of a portrait or an attempt of a portrait of his life um, in a more abstract way, in a more experimental way, I think Moody Daydream is a, a classic example of that. Best trailer, I have Spiderhead, official trailer, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, official teaser, Violent Night, official trailer, Babylon, official teaser trailer, and 65, official trailer. And the winner is... Spiderhead official trailer. Uh, so Black Panther Connor Forever, that official teaser, almost won, but just that ability of the transition we get from No Woman, No Cry, and more of the softer remembrance of Chadwick Boseman, and then we get into the action of the trailer, and then we see more of Namor, and we transition from No Woman to Cry into Kendrick Lamar's All Right. It's a beautiful music transition. When we see the sort of beautiful shots of Black Panther Connor Forever, I had some questions after the curseness of that set and the death of Chadwick Boseman, what are you gonna do? But after seeing that trailer, it calmed all of my nerves and reminded me that, oh yeah, oh right, Ryan Coogler is one of the best directors of his generation, and that trailer officially confirmed that to me. Um, official, uh, then Violent Night official trailer. Um, sometimes trailers like this or 65 sort of introduce themselves, you haven't heard anything about it, and you see it, and it's like, oh, David Harbour playing Santa, who's also kind of like John Wick or uh, John McClane, you know, this kind of Die Hard-esque uh, situation. Harbour immediately sort of understood the sort of gentle warmness of Santa, but also kind of the badassness. Just the idea and then seeing the execution, it was like, oh man, I'm going to see this day one. I did, and it was an awesome movie, and the trailer sold me on it. A Babylon official teaser trailer, just that opening uh, opening credits uh, of the Paramount logo with all the, the, the stars around its logo, and then it being sniffed up by the Coke. Um, just the sort of fast-paced editing on the music, chopping, combined with Hurwitz's uh, own score in the film. You know, it's a good rate score when they use it within the trailer and not, you know, pre-existing song. It showed the sort of fast-paced energy, excitement that um, I had wanted. And this is a movie that I didn't even see any, um, you know, tr um, images that they released. They sort of just dropped the trailer and I was like, here you go, Babylon teaser trailer, long teaser trailer, lots of different images, Tobey Maguire, Maguire being crazy. 
and it was exactly what I wanted. Um, so a great trailer there. 65 was the trailer where, like Violet Knight, revealed of, of a premise of a movie that hasn't come out yet, but it's like Adam Driver in the sort of classic kind of 90s sci-fi garbage type film but then with a great premise of the fact that this is a, a guy who comes to uh, uh, you know an alien guy who comes to earth when the dinosaurs are still here and it's like a, a dinosaur horror movie the jurassic movies have only been the movies that have utilized dinosaurs i feel like that's been a mistake and 65 has recognized that hey dinosaurs aren't an, uh, an existing ip you know you can use them for any movie uh, but the winner was spiderhead for official trailer which was a trailer that sold me on the film regardless of, of critical reviews or whatnot uh, its use of song, its use of strangeness, of you know, great lines, probably the best lines from the movie are in the trailer, unfortunately, but still Chris Hemsworth with his sort of funny, eccentric performance, who almost got nominated for supporting actor. I thought he was really terrific and, and funny. So you have that in there, but then you have Miles Teller, who's unsure of where these tests are going to go. So a sense of mystery, but also comedy, um, set with a brilliant song, um, pre-existing, of course, um, really accumulated to a great trailer. I know a lot of people don't talk about trailers, or if they do, they talk about the big ones like Indiana Jones or Black Panther. But if you haven't seen the Spiderhead trailer, Trailer. absolutely do it's really terrific best cinematography i've got the northman jaron blashk uh blonde chase irvin the batman greg frazier bones and all arseni kachaturan and babylon lina sangren and the winner is babylon lina sangren so the northman a movie that i didn't totally love but has a cre incredible distinct visual style whether it be those sequences of the one takes of the raid village of um alexander Skarsgård catching that spear and throwing it back to the sort of star wars uh, prequel-esque ending of the, the fight at the volcano there's a sense of <clears throat> brutality in the film that i think is accentuated through the cinematography and through those colors uh, the Northman, Jaron Blanche, has a, did a great job with The Witch and an even better job with The Lighthouse, but I think he's even upgraded again here for The Northman. Uh, so great to see him there. Blonde, Chase Irvin. There's times when I don't even recognize Anna Armas, and I think that's Marilyn Monroe, whether it be the beautiful color cinematography or that black and white or that sort of combination to go back and forth. The stark contrast of the blacks and the whites I thought were brilliant and the shadows and how they're able to use it almost as like an impressionistic type or a renaissance type-esque um, painting of you know like a Caravaggio painting starting with black there are moments where we have really deep deep blacks contrasted with beautiful whites the black and white cinematography probably my favorite even over the color stuff but even when I'm talking about you know the Adrian Brody <coughs> um, Marilyn Monroe sequences they're really beautiful too and, and colorful but also in a strange hazy way Chase Irvin did an incredible job for blonde the Batman, Greg Frazier, beautiful sort of slow push-ins and ambiance and, and tone setting. He establishes the tone so much through that photography. Of course, you have the rain, of course, you have the costumes, but in that sort of sl uh, slow camera movements, the sort of shadows of the darkness to sort of hide Batman, and then, of course, certain images that are stuck in my head, whether it be just Zoe Kravitz walking down, doing her sort of catwalk, or the sort of overhead of Batman with the red flare. He's created some iconic images immediately, and um, <clears throat> he's one of our best working cinematographers, I think. Bones and all, this is a really interesting young cinematographer that I hadn't really heard of, but when you see the sort of simplicity of the frames, but sort of the wide, um, not wide lenses, but sort of large frames where you have a lot of people within them, rarely almost using the close-up, using that, um, purposefully but then you also when you do have close-ups or you have these odd angles to uh, accentuate sort of strange and odd characters so much through the, the the framing of the sort of american landscape shows the loneliness and the connection that these two desire but then of course the smart framing of the close-ups to accentuate something like um a nervousness or comfort depending on how you see that the, the person's pov really well done Beautiful stuff here. I want to give Bones and All a shout out. But the winner was Babylon from Lina Sandgren. One shot in particular where we have Brad Pitt sort of leading his his drunk character up up a hill to try to get that final magic uh, sunshot light. We have them in silhouette. I thought was probably the shot of the year. But even the craziness of the uh, of the the party and there's a, a real strong sense of golden glow throughout the whole film. 
And I really haven't seen a movie use yellows and gold so well since really a movie like The Godfather, Godfather Part Two. We haven't really seen something of that element where they use yellows so well. And I thought the party scene, um, or even sort of the descent into hell scene, or particularly that sort of uh, Gold Coast sunset, um, some of the most iconic shots of the year, or that sort of final shot, not the final shot of the film, but the shot of Margot sort of dancing off into the fog uh, with, with just sort of this brilliantly framed painter-esque beautiful use of colors with Sangrain is the absolute best at. Uh, once again, showing his dominance here. Great stuff for Babylon, well-deserving winner. Best Ensemble, I have Jackass Forever, Bones and All, Emergency, X, and Blonde. And my winner goes to Jackass Forever. Uh, so Bones and All, whether it be a strange David Gordon Green appearance or Michael Stuhlbarg and their strange kind of duo, or Timothy Chalamet and Taylor Russell, two stars for the future of all film, they've been so good in that, they were so good in that central film. Or like I mentioned, that Chloe Sevigny small fart. Every character within the film represented something um, beyond themselves in the sense that they were able to transcend their movie star persona, or understanding persona, and become true characters within this world. So Bones and All was terrific there. Emergency is a small kind of a super bed-esque kind of night gone wrong college uh, comedy in which I thought every member of the cast were all new to me, all brand new faces, but totally exemplified their characters. I totally understood who they were. They felt like they had backstories. They felt like they were actually real lived in people. It's almost in a way where if I see them in something else, I, I think of them as their main character. So in part, big credits to the casting director of Emergency for building this great uh, ensemble of young actors who I was personally unaware of, but were terrific in. X, um, almost one for Best Ensemble, just because whether it be Jenny Ortega or Martin Henderson or Mia Goth, there's similarly with Emergency, you understand each of their, their roles, each of their characters, who they are, in part because of the design and the costumes that are brought upon them, but also their performances and how they kind of evolve. Mia Goth, of course, is terrific in this, playing sort of dual characters as well, so she gets a little respect there for Ensemble. Uh, and then Blonde, I wanted to talk about because whether it be Anna Armas and her central performance or Adrian Brody or Bobby Cannavale or Xavier Samuel or Julian Nicholson, it's these actors who, you have the names of Adrian Brody and Bobby Cannavale, but even like a Julian Nicholson or Xavier Samuel, they bring, you know, they can compete with Anna Armas in Blonde in this beautiful way and add little sort of pieces of, of, of character and little, uh, you know, different pigments to the overall film in their respective roles. One of my favorite scenes of the year is almost, you know, I didn't mention it, but it, it's right up there, almost got nominated, was the scene between Bobby Cannavale and Anna Armas, the sort of Joe DiMaggio blonde first meetup, and what Anna is able to do there, and then how Bobby is able to return back, um, bring so much color and, and, and flourish and life to the film, and, and accentuate so much of that trauma that uh, Marilyn experienced. But the winner was Jackass Forever, and kind of an inspired choice just because. I love this crew, I love seeing them back again. But then also, not only is it the legacy crew that they brought back of, of, of Steve-O and Johnny Knoxville, but it's the new guys a, as well. And um, uh, what they were able to bring, uh, and the kind of, you know, um, Zach-ass, Zach or Wolfie, which she's you know, so great at um, the, the, the stunts where she doesn't even seem affected at all. To Jasper or his dad, it's one of these situations where if you were to make a Jackass 5 with just the new cast, I would watch it. They had such a sort of inviting sense of warmth and passion and, and fun. They really did feel like their own sort of group of friends, and that's a great testament to bringing sort of the new legacy of, of the, the characters in the film. So mad respects there to Jackass Forever, the best ensemble winner. Best needle drop in, the, in a film, a new category. Um, I have something in the way from the Batman. Sailing, ambulance. Won't get fooled again, Top Gun Maverick. And the winner is something in the way from the Batman. So sailing, ambulance, I talked about it in my favorite scene sequence, but just a great needle drop and an unexpected one in an action-packed film that brought that sense of levity. Won't get fooled again from Top Gun Maverick. A song that almost got revived in the sense that this was a classic kind of a boring commercial song. It had almost gone past the point of being able to use it in a movie and that they use it kind of an ultimate dad song. A great song, but still used sort of in a funny, brilliant, sort of awesome sequence almost so corny to the point of transcending that um, kind of really worked well surprising um, but totally works and then something in the way from the batman was the ultimate winner just because of the mood piece where you're able to take this you know well-known nirvana song now immediately associated with the batman i think if you play that song <laughs> and you 
play a guy looking out the window, people aren't going to think of Nirvana anymore. I think they're going to think of the Batman because of how so well it was used. Um, just of that sort of riding around with the motorcycle and the narration. It adds so, so much of that darkness and that emo and that pain that Batman is feeling. An iconic uh, song, but now it's used so iconically that I think people will think about that song in conjunction with the Batman. Best first time filmmaker, I have Zach Kreger from Barbarian, John Patton Ford, Emily the Criminal, Charlotte Wells, After Sun, Dean Fleischer Camp, Marcel the Shill with Shoes On, and Lila, Lila Neub Neubauer Causeway. The winner is Zach Kreger, Barbarian. Uh, so here, John Patton Ford, Emily the Criminal, an underrated movie that I think a lot of us saw on Netflix, but you know, it had been out before that. Great at just doing a sort of simple kind of 70s-esque thriller within modernizing it for the, the, the today's day of being student loan debt. Charlotte Wells and After Sun, an incredibly confident directorial debut where she is able to show subtlety and not show everything and that actually being the strength of the film. A Dean Fleischer Camp, Marcel Show with Shoes On. I almost went with this movie, but because I think of this movie so much as like a collaboration with everybody and he's in the film, but then it's also you know written by Jenny Slate and I bet there's probably a lot of collaborations with the film and then stop motion, of course the animators have so much to do with it. So he's, I guess, technically the central force, but I do think uh, of him more in a collaboration, even though I probably like Marcel Lachelle with shoes on more than Barbarian. I'll talk about Mar Marcel Lachelle a little bit later on, but what a you know, I've already talked about it still, you know, beautiful, simple, perfect rainy day film. And he totally understands the tone and the atmosphere of the film. And then Lana Neubauer uh, for Causeway. Having, uh, being a theater director and bringing some of those sensibilities to film, I thought really worked well in the sense of a stillness, in the sense of performance first. Uh, the sense of sort of aimlessness in many ways within the film of these these two characters meeting and converging at the same time I thought uh, was really well done and, and brought a lot of those great theater sensibilities to film in, in an excellent way But the winner went to Zach Kreger for Barbarian because he's one of those guys where could he be the next Ari Aster, Robert Eggers? I think so. I think he could because of such how of a confident um, movie it was of how the screenplay was so unexpected and exciting and how much of a command he had at both the scary elements the tension but then also some of the comedy in the film he was able to do both real testament to him and his directorial debut best screenplay i have ambulance chris fedek the fablemans steven spielberg and tony kushner barbarian zach kreger tar todd field and confess fletch greg matola and zev barrow and the winner is tar todd field so Ambulance, what Chris Fedek did here I thought was a terrific job at taking an adaptation of a, 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 I think it was Swedish or Norwegian film from the 2000s. And it's a very low budget film, but sort of taking that idea and making it a big budget Hollywood scale movie. It's nothing like the original film. So his ability to adapt I thought was really brilliant and just his ability to continually evolve the story. You think it's one thing. How long can this movie last? How long can these guys be on this chase for? Well, just up the ante, then up the ante, then do something else, then make a surprise turn to keep you engaged. These sort of reveals, these extra added characters, the connections between the two, all sort of worked well so that by the end of the film, you were exhausted, you were elated, um, but you were incredible that you went on this journey. Then the Fablemans, Steven Spielberg and Tony Kushner, Great sort of funny dialogue scenes, great speeches like the hallway scene or Judd Hirsch's sort of um, passion scene of cinema, of art versus family and life. Uh, and, and just some of the funny elements, but also some of the, the, the subtleties. But particularly, I think the writing in that hallway scene does enough to get a screenplay nomination. Uh, Barbarian, Zach Kreger, as I just said, an inventive, creative, bold movie where you don't know where it's going to go able to do sort of the tense elements and the awkwardness and the unsureness of how to read things in the conversations of the first act to the second half of being kind of Justin Long-esque. Subtle, but understanding that this guy's probably not the best guy, but not totally saying it. And just the sort of twists and turns of the story. Um, he surprised himself while writing it and he surprised us while watching. Then Confess Fletch, Greg Matola and Zev Borrell. Rare to see comedies this, these days in a classic studio form, but Greg Matola is one of the best. I love Paul, I love Superbad, I love Adventureland. And he's able to create just mile a minute jokes in his stories. And he doesn't always write his films, but in this case, I'm glad he did because he totally understands his character of Fletch, of being sort of sarcastic, wisecracking guy, uh, but then still having kind of that um, 
interesting kind of funny mystery plot that still keeps you engaged. But the winner was um, Tar, Tar, Todd Field because his ability to totally understand and capture a persona in Lydia Tar and someone that is not real but feels real, of course that's exemplified and showcased and brought to life through Kate Blanchett's performance. But through the script, the intelligence of whether it be that classroom scene, whether it be even the opening and the pretension that she has with the lack of awareness or certain lines that are brought out throughout the film. And then of course that eventual sort of descent from the rise into the fall and where she ends up and the sequences that occur. Intelligent writing at its finest, engaging writing. Few films have kept me engaged all year like Todd Field's Tar. I had to recognize that writing. Okay, now we're to the final four categories. Best Director, Michael Bay, Ambulance. Joseph Kaczynski, Top Gun Maverick. Steven Spielberg, The Fablemans, Todd Field, Tar, and Koganada, After Yang. And the winner is Michael Bay, Ambulance. So uh, Kaczynski here from Top Gun Maverick, as I've mentioned, the, the sort of confidence that he has in creating this kind of classic blockbuster structure, harder to do than I think a lot of people think. It's following this sort of classic structure, but done so well, whether it be the tension of that Mach 10 sequence or the emotion in the Miles Teller, to, uh, Tom Cruise sequences, or the sort of reveals of the sort of last act, um, of, of the, the saving uh, of the sort of sacrifices. You really are unsure actually in that final act where things are gonna go. And this is just ability to create, create, create great performances, create a great structure, have characters, uh, have actors in Tom Cruise and Jennifer Connelly that have a true sort of actual romantic connection. And it's ability to control this entire production and to have that vision of Goose's kid is trying to join, that brings Top Gun, that brings um, Pete Mitchell back and uh, in this sort of revival of a sequel, uh, in this kind of reunion type, I don't know what you want to call it, I guess it is sort of a legacy sequel in many ways, uh, but when I first heard of it, I thought this was not going to be very good, and then seeing it and thinking it's one of my favorite movies of the year, mad respect to Joseph Kaczynski. Spielberg for The Fablemans, a movie that only he could make in the sense of how personal it was to him, and how touching uh, the film felt, and how personal it felt and in, in the specificities of the details and then of course how it evolves and how it never really is much more I think almost maybe more cynical or stranger than the sort of traditional I love cinema movies are the best it really is an exploration in his parents relationship and their and their connection and then also <clears throat> stuff that I think the only he doesn't even totally realize which is like this maybe weird psycho Oedipus kind of connection with his mom or his dad who maybe enjoys this kind of throuple relationship that they're in. There is some weird stuff that actually aren't really explored. It's not just, I love movies and my parents got divorced. It really is how that divorce impacts him and his life and how he sees things. Um, Spielberg is revealing a lot here and he's one of our best directors in some of the sequences of the movie and the camera. I mean, we could talk about it for days, but the blocking and the movie, of course, and any Spielberg film is terrific and it is here. Todd Field, Tar, I mentioned how great his writing is, but his directing is just as smart. In his confidence to keep these long shots and to build into not revealing too much, into using both sound design and performance and set design to create, of course, this well-lived in performance of Lydia Tar. Just a confident, uh, unique kind of a film, and Todd Field is so great at that. And, and Koganada for After Yang, who has quickly become one of my favorite directors, whether it be Columbus or this film After Yang. I think because it was released earlier in the year, a lot of people have forgot about it. But this film, whether it be the aspect ratio changes to indicate memories, or whether it be the sort of ability to play with editing and time and to talk about memories and to have a still movie, a uh, quiet movie, but still have an engaging movie, I thought was a really challenging, kind of a combination as a director. Uh, so I wanted to give him some respect after being one of my favorite movies of the year, as we'll talk about later. But the winner was Michael Bay for Ambulance. And I really do think Ambulance is a movie like Mad Max Free Road or <laughs> Mission Impossible Fallout or something, where it kind of changes and resets what we expect from action movies. It really is one of those classic action movies in the 21st century for me. And its ability to have rapid camera work, handheld stuff that's somewhat shaky, but then of course the introduction of the drones, fast moving helicopter-esque shots that can go from a top of a building down to the bottom of a building in two seconds, underneath cars, around um, you know, cars moving at the same time. 
there's a level of complexity, uh, complexity that I think is underrated. If you know action movies and if you've seen them, it's hard to not do a movie like Taken 3, which is just trying to edit a lot to make it seem like it's engaging. And then when it, as something is engaging, sometimes if you edit too much, it's hard to follow and hard to track and hard to process. But Bay is able to keep all of that in control, the tension, keep it and hold it for two hours and 15 minutes. Not even someone like a Hitchcock could do it for that long. Bay, I really do think is one of our best directors. In the Oscars, when we talk about well, how good the Fablemans is and Tar and the Banshees of Inisherin, and I go, yes, I agree. But we don't talk about Michael Bay and we talk about how his movies stink. I just don't understand that at all. I think Ambulance is one of the best movies of the year and the directing of work goes to Michael Bay because of his ability to craft an incredible, tense, exciting, funny action sequence that an action movie that we very rarely see. In the same way I think of George Miller as a great action director, I think of Michael Bay in the same way. I think of them similarly very much. Best lead actress, I have Havana Rose Lou from No Exit, Jenny Slate, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, Emma Thompson, Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, Kate Blanchett, Tar, and Ana de Armas from Blonde. And the winner is... Kate Blanchett, Tar. Uh, Havana Rose Lou from No Exit. I want to recognize her, even though I want to talk about maybe like a Mia Goth from a Pearl. A lot of critics have been talking about her, but no one's been talking about Havana Rose Lou from No Exit. A really exciting a tense thriller, low budget thriller that you can find on Disney Plus now from the old Fox, that Greenland, it's sort of Searchlight-esque, sort of a great cabin in the woods, um, thing-esque snowy thriller, and she is the central heart of it, being kind of unsure of the kid in the the, the, the van that she finds out and then who that's going to be, and then how that evolves, and then how she reveals. So just the sense of horror and heroism that she displays in the film from a person that I didn't really know too much about before going to the film really wowed me. Jenny Slate, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On. Similarly, when I talk about Isabella Rossellini for Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, Jenny Slate and her ability to modulate uh, Marcel's voice really brings a sense of life and breath to her, him as a character that she brings. And his sort of outlook on life and his appreciation of that and the way he says something there's a way to say something marcel-esque so the fact that she's able to accentuate the dialogue that you know she helped write through that also w with the the um performance of just voice with very little limited, limited expression on the actual character to create a believable and and, and heartwarming person uh, Jenny Slate, I thought was terrific in that. Um, Emma Thompson, good luck to you. Leo Grant almost won this because I think she is the king of the reaction shot. I mean, it's so easy almost to make a film when you have Emma Thompson in this, even though the film is essentially um, a play in that there's like this the, the one location in, in these three, four acts. It's so easy to just, you know, cut to her for a reaction shot while um, Daryl McCormack is, is, is talking. She's great at being sort of reserved, but then trying to understand, but then sort of being behind the times. One of her great performances, it's kind of a shame that she couldn't compete for the Oscars, but I think she should be uh, at the very least considered uh, one of our great actors and a reminder that, oh yeah, hey, I'm still here. I'm still batting 100 great stuff from her. Uh, Anna de Armas from Blonde. I really liked Blonde. I know it's a controversial opinion, but it, in part it's because of Anna de Armas and the effort that she brings to performance. Like I said, there were times where I didn't realize it was her and I thought it was Marilyn Monroe and that they're using old footage in that kind of a blend sequence. Like Colin Farrell talked about at the Golden Globes, her scene where she's crying and then looks over to the empty um, do, uh, empty sort of area where the door is. Her ability to sort of convey the emotions but also the tragedy of Marilyn Monroe. Anna Darmus has been a good actor. She hasn't wowed me though. I mean, she was good in Blade Runner 2049, then she was good in Knives Out. Great in something like No Time to Die, but a real sort of dramatic performance where she's able to convey empathy and emotion and trauma and confusion and anger and heartbreak. Uh, she hasn't really done it uh, like this in, in Blonde. And really, you know, I liked her as an actor, but now she's like, wow, really announcing herself as, as someone that can go to this level. But the winner still is Kate Blanchett from Tar. In one of her best performances, which is crazy to say, and the same actor that's done, you know, Carol, can still come out with this. And what a physical and demanding seeming performance. Just if you look at her facial structure, it almost looks way different than she even would do in something like Carol. 
but that conveying of intelligence, of ego, of narcissism, at least the way I see Lydia Tarr. But then also I think sympathy. I think she understands that this character is engaging and interesting and maybe unaware of some of her own flaws, but the genius that we still are uh, completely connected to. And then of course I think the relatability, at least for me, of that sense of trying to control things and being in control at all times and then not having you losing your game or losing that sense of control and letting it slip out of your fingers and the tr difficulty that that has. But the fact that Kate Blanchett, when she's playing Lydia Tarr, never totally realizes it, never understands what's going to come next, that she's so in her own pretension that she doesn't realize that. Kate is able to sort of play both, play the lack of awareness, but then also the sort of genuine performance that she's able to command a physical performance, an intense performance, the central performance of the film, and the reason why it is so good, I had to go with Kate Blanchett here for Tar. Then best lead actor I have, Robert Pattinson, The Batman, Jake Gyllenhaal, Ambulance, Tom Cruise, Top Gun Maverick, Colin Farrell, After Yang, and George Clooney, Ticket of Paradise. And the winner is Tom Cruise, Top Gun Maverick. So here Robert Pattinson for The Batman, Christian Bale is one of the best Batmans of all time. Robert Pattinson may be better. Uh, I don't say that lightly. I thought he was great at really making Bruce the central character of the film and making the sort of real trauma of his parents' death haunt him and drive him in the sense of revenge and the sense of justice that we've seen in the comic books, but really actually being explored now in the film. That sort of revenge, that justice being him trying to fill this hole of his lack of parents and then that very fatherly figure in Andy Serkis and his scene um, with him with the most powerful well, moving scenes of the film. So his ability to have this, I think that physicality still, to have that deep voice, but to be more of the detective style of the Batman, which we haven't totally seen. A different kind of a Batman, but one of my favorites so far. And I thought he'd be a great choice, uh, casting choice when a lot of people didn't, but uh, I'm glad to say I was right. And I think Robert Pattinson may be one of the best Batman, which is saying something. Jake Gyllenhaal for Ambulance in a great kind of over-the-top performance but perfectly executed if you like the sort of craziness in like the second half of nightcrawler or even like the trauma of like a of a demolition jake Jonah hall goes even crazier in this film it's that sort of second half of nightcrawler in the craziest extent He's a loose cannon in the definition. You don't know what he's going to do. He's funny, he's charming, he's witty, but he can also snap on a dime like that. He, he's truly psychotic in the film and he's a joy to watch. Uh, Colin Farrell from After Yang. A contemplative, reflective kind of performance. Of course, he's had such a great year, 13 Lives, The Batman, Banshees of Inner Sharon. Um, I wanted to recognize him for After Yang because it was one of my favorite movies of the year, but also because of his ability to recollect. This is a scene, a movie where he doesn't have a lot of chances to have dialogue, but it's a scene of him watching memories, or of him recollecting, or of him trying to understand what this man's life was in Yang, and his connection to him, and his connection to his daughter, and even though he wasn't part of the family, he was. It's a, it's a series of him thinking things without always saying them, but it's always still communicated through his performance. I think Farrell is able to uh, commu uh, do that really well. I thought Farrell was able to do that really well and clearly within the film, and that was kind of the genius that I thought he gave to the film. And then George Clooney, Ticket of Paradise, because he can do both, because he can do the comedic screwball stuff where he's very funny, we're going to have that back and forth, but then you can also have the emotional conversation about his past life, or you can have the emotional connection with his daughter, or have that resolution at the end. A true movie star performance, but also a true great acting performance, in the sense that he can be charming and funny. That's his standard. But then he can also have the real serious dramatic stuff and make that land too. You don't get that in, in every sort of rom-com. You do get that in this film. That's why George Clooney, you know, Julie Roberts also very well done, but Clooney was the one that really stuck out to me. But the winner is uh, Tom Cruise from Top Gun Maverick. I wanted to actually give him the award in um, 2018, but I gave it to Robert Redford th for The Old Man and the Gun. And he's been sort of due, and this is his sort of makeup Oscar in many ways, but, or makeup Connor, excuse me. Um, but regardless, I still think he's still probably the best performance of the year. Because, like I mentioned, you know, Cruz, I think, is best at when he's like an Indiana Jones type hero. He's not like this ultra badass kind of Ethan Hunt. I actually do think he's best in Edge of Tomorrow or in Magnolia or even in Collateral, where there's a sense of confidence being portrayed. But in the next scene, we see that 
insecurity also being there. There's a duality that he's able to bring. So he's still this great badass action hero who, listen, you guys, I can tell you can do it in this time. Nobody believes me. I'm going to do it. I'm going to show you. I'm going to do it 15 seconds underneath the, the time frame. And I'm going to show you how perfection is able to do it so that you can actually physically do it. I'm going to do that and I'm going to be a part of the team. So to show that demonstration of excellence, but then also have the I, I, Iceman Maverick reunion scene or to have the scene with Miles Teller or even some of the more uh, softer, quieter scenes with Jennifer Connelly where he has and expresses his insecurities, where we see his unsureness of this. It makes him human. It makes him feel more realistic. It's not this ultra badass action hero. Yes, he can do that. Yes, he's good at that. It's the other stuff that he really brings in this film. And that monologue with um, Maverick and Iceman's reunion where he really breaks down. Uh, I haven't seen Cruz act like that in a long time, and it's a reminder that, oh, right, this guy is so good. He can do the action stuff, but that's not just him. He can also do the heartwarming, the emotional, the impactful stuff, and I wish we get to see more of that in, in his later films, but we definitely got to see that for Top Gun Maverick, and massive respects for Cruz for making the film and being a producer and bringing cinemas back in many ways, but also for his performance in that film. Gotta give him the Connor. Now, here we are, best picture, the final big category of the video, starting off with my 10 nominees. Jackass Forever, The Fablemans, Ambulance, After Yang, Top Gun Maverick, Blonde, Marcel the Shell with Shoes on, Tar, Babylon, and The Batman. And the winner is... Ambulance. So Jackass Forever, what a, a fun time at the movie theaters. Just remember sitting in, in my, my seat, reveling in the fact of how crazy and gross and strange it was. You know, you couldn't look away, but you kind of want to. Um, I know an extended long most YouTube video, but one of the best YouTube videos, so still kind of counts. Uh, and the sort of genius sequences that they're able to continually go after another. Very rarely do you have like joke a minute studio companies, but this is in, in a way is kind of like that because there's so many sort of crazy fun stunts. Then the Fablemans, one of the best memory pieces from one of our great directors. Dano was genius in it, but so is Michelle Williams, but so is Gabriel LaBelle. Strange, inexplicable in many ways, cynical, um, but yet still heartwarming, yet still passionate about films and cinema and life. It really does feel like some of my favorite movies, like a Boyhood or Citizen Kane, like a life capsule on screen within two hours and you can see everything and everyone's fully realizing it feels so specific, it feels so real and there's great moments of revelation and memories and it's great, it's a movie that reminds you of somebody that's able to just sort of take their m key moments of their life and express that and that's who I am today. Uh, then after Yang, uh, beautiful film from Koganon as I mentioned, just subtle uh, Ozu-esque but still entertaining. Reminds me actually of Badlands in many ways where Malik has got this clear distinct style but with Badlands he still wants to tell an interesting story. Kokonaha does that as well. He can do a very experimental relaxing kind of a piece but he still is interested in telling engaging stories. Um, a story about memory, about time, about what it means, what are the th things that stick with you, what are your passions in life. Uh, it's a contemplative film in, in every respect of the word and a uh, movie I totally uh, re responded to. Top Gun Maverick, the best action movie of the year. A classic blockbuster in the form that we very rarely get these days. One of the all-time best blockbusters. Blonde, a controversial movie, yes, but I think in its outset, its goals were achieved in that let's tell a story about Marilyn Monroe and the traumas that she had to face throughout her time in Hollywood, and let's make that sort of clear to the audience. Was it need to be three hours long? Maybe not, but was that sort of message clear? Absolutely, and whether it be, I think, really impactful, surrealist scenes, beautiful cinematography, beautiful design, great performances from everyone around, uh, a movie that I, you know, I know, I know what a lot of people don't resonate with, but I definitely did. Maybe unfortunately, I don't know if I love that I resonate with it, <laughs> um, but it, the truth of the matter is I did. Marcel the Shell with Shoes on, the best rainy day movie, the best Sunday afternoon movie. Put it on, makes you feel better, calming, relaxing, but incredibly sightful. And, and has a lot of wisdom in it. Tar, which had an inexplicable stranglehold on my attention for two and a half hours, confident in its filmmaking, you never know really where it's going to go. Fascinating character study of King Blanchett, powerful film. Babylon, crazy, extreme, loud, 
but also sentimental, but also real. The epic and the intimate, the beginning passion of film to the end. Is it cynical? Is it hopeful? I guess it's the way you look at it. It's a really beautiful piece of, of art in that way. And it's a swing for the fences. And maybe it missed for you, but it hit for me. And the passion and the excitement and the emotion all totally worked. Then the Batman. Uh, one of my favorite Batman movies. Too long? Yes. Unobjective, objectively too long. But the stuff that's in it, the stuff that works really does work. And I'm a big superhero movie fan. I'm a big Batman fan. And to see this well realized on, on film and to have these sort of really interesting, great sequences with a great cast and great Batman and great score, hard to beat. But the winner was Ambulance. As I mentioned earlier, I think that this is one of the all time great action films. I think Michael Bay did a terrific job at creating that tension and just the sort of confidence, I guess you would say, of that screenplay, of the direction of the film in general, to continually create new engaging things. I mean, I just had a smile across my face throughout the entire film. You know, is it realistic? No. Well, when you have a guy who's being stitched up in the middle of an ambulance, not by a surgeon, in the middle of an ambulance, in a car chase, it's just craziness. Uh, leveled on top of each other. It's an acceptance that this is a heightened reality and a total commitment to that. And all my best, and all my favorite films are sort of like a commitment to an idea or a great idea executed brilliantly and ambulance is the, the same for that. And I do think it'll be a movie I'll continue to watch over and over again for the rest of my life. But that's about it guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Comment below, let me know your favorite movies of the year. Uh, and stay tuned, don't worry, we're going to go back to the Oscar predictions and whatnot in coming weeks. This is just a, a fun little one-off video. But that's about it. Until next time, stay tuned.